I would like to show you the game theory of addiction. And it's going to be a battle between two versions of yourself. There's the higher version of yourself and the kernel version of yourself. And this is going to help us think through a few different things about addiction. First, we're going to see why addiction is an unstable condition, even if you're trying to get help and trying to stop. Second, we'll look at what are the conditions that make recovery stable. And third, we'll look at why self-punishment doesn't work. And I'm going to post a different video that explains how I came up with these payoffs. Actually, I'll post a few more videos that look at this problem. But for this one, we, we can look at the situation and we can solve for Nash equilibrium in the same way we always do. And Nash equilibrium, of course, is going to be a no regrets situation where both players can look at what the other player has chosen and, and they can say, given what that other player did, I'm happy with my choice. So we solve this by first looking from player one's perspective, the carnal self who is trying to decide, do I use or not use? You can think about this game across many different types of addiction, whether that's alcohol or drugs or pornography or gambling or food addiction, like sugar addiction, something like that. There's many different ways of looking at this, even perhaps social media addiction. Although, of course, this strategy up here is going to be attending a 12-step program. So um, I don't know which, which addictions have full-on 12-step programs. Like, it, are there programs for social media yet? I don't know. But in any case, let's solve this for Nash equilibrium by first looking at player one's perspective. This is the kernel self and they're trying to decide, do I use or not use, where the payoffs in each of these boxes are the red payoffs. And of course, the higher self is trying to decide, do I attend AA or not? Now, thinking from the Colonel Self's perspective, they are going to check each of the other player's strategies. So they ask the question, if the higher self goes to AA, would I prefer to be using or not using? And my... my Best choice in that case would be to not use. And then we check the higher self's other strategy and we say if the higher self doesn't go to AA, is my best response to use or to not use from the kernel self's perspective? And we can see that the kernel self thinks the best response is to use. Now we flip perspectives and think from the higher self's perspective, looking at the payoffs to the higher self, which are in purple, and we check the other player's strategies. So the higher self says, if the carnal self would have used, would I have preferred the negative 10 from going to AA or the negative 20 from not going to AA? And I would prefer the negative 10. And if the kernel self does not use, would I have preferred the 10 or the 20? Well, in this case, I would prefer the 20. So if the kernel self is not using, basically if you're not an addict, you would prefer not to go to the AA meetings. And this is sort of you wishing you weren't an addict. You, you longing after the life where your kernel self doesn't make that choice and, uh, and you don't have to show up at these meetings. Now, we can see that there's no pure strategies Nash equilibrium here. Uh, pure strategies Nash equilibrium happens when there's two circles in the same box so that both players can say, given what the other player did, I'm happy with my choice. But that does not exist here. And that means a few things. There may be a Nash equilibrium, but that Nash equilibrium is going to have both players mixing between their choices. So the higher self sometimes going to AA and sometimes not, and the kernel self sometimes using and sometimes not. And of course, that is a equilibrium that we actually see, right? We see equilibriums where uh, addicts go back and forth to AA, go back and forth between use, and that seems to be the norm in the addict world. And of course, the higher self doesn't like that outcome because they don't like the kernel self mixing between strategies, but that happens. So we can ask ourselves, why is this such an unstable equilibrium? Like which of these payoffs matter most for making this unstable? And how can we actually change the payoffs 
especially from the higher self's perspective, to make a stable equilibrium. The higher self is basically trying to force this as a Nash equilibrium. The higher self wants the higher self going to AA and the carnal self not using. This is what they want as a Nash equilibrium. But why is this not a Nash equilibrium? It's not because if the carnal self is not using, if that is the carnal self's perpetual choice, then the higher self, their best response to that is to not go to AA. It's time consuming, it's onerous, all that stuff. And therefore, if you've, if you've been sober for a really long time, or if you haven't used whatever it is that you're addicted to for a really long time, the higher self may say, well, the carnal self seems to have their act together. I can switch over here into the non 12 step action box. And of course, we know that once you step over here, the carnal self is going to say, oh, well, my best response when you're not going to AA is to use. And so we end up up in this box. And then the higher self says, oh, well, if you're gonna use, my best response is to go to AA. And then the carnal self says, okay, if you're gonna make that choice, I'll come down here and I won't use. But as soon as you get used to the carnal self not using, that equilibrium has a tendency to become destabilized. And this is what happens with addicts. Now, the higher self is the self that is going to try to influence these payoffs um, in various ways. And so the, the higher self might ask the question, if I want a stable Nash equilibrium in this box, how do I get there? Can I get there by punishing the carnal self for use? And, and in that case, we ask ourselves, if I punish the carnal self, if I impose all of these self punishments and make it more embarrassing or more painful or, or whatever on the carnal self from using, how does that change the game? Well, what that changes is it changes the payoff in this box to the carnal self. It makes use more painful. Instead of negative 20, this becomes negative 50 or negative 100. And the question is, does that actually change this equilibrium? And the answer is no, it doesn't change that equilibrium. Negative 20 is already worse than negative 15, so that is not going to work. Now, if you have a situation where the higher self is going to AA and the kernel self is still using, that, that means that this payoff is higher than this payoff, and in which case, maybe making this payoff worse might be a good response there. But in this current situation, that's not, that's not what's causing the destabilization. What's causing the destabilization is the fact that the 20 is better than the 10. So if the kernel self is not using, the best response from the higher self is to not go to AA. And that's what's sort of creating the instability. If we can somehow change this such that instead of 10, this payoff to the higher self is even higher than the payoff from not going to AA, then we're going to have a stable equilibrium. So here we have a Nash equilibrium, which is one that the higher self is happy with. Now we might ask ourselves, how do you actually get this payoff to be higher than this payoff? Well, one answer is gratitude. If you're thankful for the AA experience, if being with this group of people, if experiencing this spiritual growth is worth it in your life, such that your life with AA is way better than your life ever could have been without AA, then you have a stable equilibrium. Then you have a stable recovery. You will be sober in the long term if this is the case but you have to sort of keep this up. You have to continue going to AA because otherwise this payoff is going to increase relative to this payoff. You'll slip over here and you'll end up back in the cycle. So this is why for AA groups, one of the things they depend on is not just addressing the addiction, but making the experience of AA worth it on an even higher level than the experience of not being an addict. Now, let me address the situation where you have someone who's stuck in an equilibrium up here because that, of course, happens, and in that case, you do need to ask what is the response to it. 
This is not a good equilibrium, of course, and the only thing I changed in this case was the payoff to the kernel self of not using when the higher self is attending AA. I made this really, really painful. And that might be just because it not using actually is painful to addicts. Like you, that's, that's just a reality. So in which case the kernel self may still choose to use even if the higher self is going to AA. And in this case, what you need to do is you need to make sure that this payoff is higher than this payoff. And you can do this with both the carrot and the stick. You can do, the, do this by making use more painful. Um, and that could be because you don't feel as much a part of the group. It could be that uh, you don't get to serve in the service position in your AA group. There could be a lot of things that actually do make this more painful. And then you could make this less painful potentially by um, letting the AA member call someone to, to get some friendship help in that moment when they're feeling the, the deep craving and the pain that they know will be relieved by use of the substance. So both of those factors are going to influence these two paths. They're both features of AA programs and they help move this best response down here to get us back into a better equilibrium. Now finally, I want to show you why self-punishment, apart from an AA program, is generally a bad strategy. So let me do that. And by self-punishment, there's all kinds of self-punishment uh, that can be involved here. I mean, kicking yourself, uh, wallowing in guilt. There's many, many types of self-punishment that addicts have tried. And it does not tend to work. It tends to lead to this spiral that they end up in. Now the question is why, and of course if we look at this, um, it's the same reason I mentioned before. It's the fact that if you um, increase the cost of the punishment, that's basically increasing this payoff here from negative 20 to negative 50 to negative 100 to negative 500, and that doesn't actually change this cyclical game, right? Changing this payoff, this is an off equilibrium payoff. The negative 15 is better than the punishment. You're not actually changing the rules of the game. And of course, if you punish yourself, there is no way that punishment could be better than non-punishment. So because it's impossible to get this number, the 10, higher than the 50, and also because increasing this doesn't help, punishment cannot get out of this spiraling cycle. Now, there's some other things about punishment, particularly like guilt-related punishment, wallowing in guilt, which is that punishment can actually increase the pain that usage of the substance or usage of the addictive behavior assuages. So the punishment can increase the value of using. You know that using is going to create escape from that pain of guilt or that pain of the punishment that you've self-imposed. And that's going to make both of these payoffs better if you're involved in punishment. Like it's much better to use that the reward is much higher because you're relieved from the pain of the punishment. So punishment has this paradoxical uh, interaction when we're talking about the game theory of addiction. So that's just an overview of what is the game theory of addiction.